thank you everyone for your company today and I'm delighted again on behalf of the Melbourne Press Club to welcome you here and particularly to welcome Laura Tingle to today's gathering. Throughout her print and broadcasting career, Laura has maintained a passion for and a dedication to her craft. She is one of Australia's most hardworking and prolific journalists and is widely respected both here and overseas. Her move to television a couple of years ago to become Chief Political Correspondent for the ABC 730 program introduced Laura to a broader audience. Just as her columns in the Fin Review are a must read, Laura's nightly discussions with us via the telly are now compulsory viewing for all voters and all parties. Laura has won two Walkley Awards and in 2004 she won the prestigious Paul Larnham Award for Press Gallery Journalism. She has written two books and is the author of four quarterly essays, the fourth of which is the catalyst for our discussion today. The High Road, What Australia Can Learn from New Zealand, is a superbly crafted extended piece of long form journalism which takes readers back and forward across the Tasman from the early days of European settlement, when at one point the two countries might have become one, right through to 2020, the year of the pandemic, and the different ways Prime Ministers Jacinda Ardern and Scott Morrison have managed their messages and their politics. This is a very clever assessment of both countries' political and economic evolution. It is also a cracking good yarn. It is Laura Tingle at her very best. But Laura, you told me a couple of years ago after you completed your third quarterly essay for Black Ink that you would never write another one. <laughs> what happened? Uh, I did, Corey, and... Um, and uh... I, I'm not quite sure. Uh, you, you sort of get, you suddenly get this idea, and you think that's a good idea. Oh, I could do that, and um, and and then you're off again. But I think I think I'm definitely sworn off doing another one because this one, this one particularly because of the pandemic, but but because I had to match uh, was you know was it was a real challenge, but. So satisfying to do, so satisfying. Before we get on to the essay itself, Laura, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on, um, I guess it's a constantly annoying suggestion in some quarters, yeah. but with fewer newspapers and increased budget cuts in newsrooms, the golden days of journalism are over and the good journalism is dead. Mm. But doesn't a vehicle like Maury Schwartz's quarterly essay or indeed new technologies like podcasts and blogs and Twitter and the like suggest otherwise, that there are opportunities for good journalism? Oh, I think, I think that's in, entirely true. I mean, if you think about, we go back to the days when you and I were at the age and it was the, you know, the, the golden river of uh, income from classifieds holding up the newspapers. I mean, it all looked pretty bleak, but when you think about it, technology has reduced the barriers to entry. Basically, anybody can get in there. Now, there are downsides of that, of course, um, as, as we sort of see with fake news, um, you know, in, 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 its, in its true fake sense. Uh, but I think it also does give all, all these other opportunities for discussions, for people to do their own investigations. And, you know, there's a, there's a richness, I think, that has developed um, because the world has become more complex, there's you know, a bombardment of information and we've now got a really diverse range of uh, sources uh, of journalism in different forms uh, to appreciate if we, if we only have the time to do it. Your partner, Sam Neill, of course, is one of New Zealand's great ambassadors, I guess I could say, especially for his country's wine industry. <laughs> And I just wondered, before we get on to the, um, you know, your sort of more professional observations of, of how the two relationships have evolved between the two countries, economically and politically, I wondered socially and from a first-hand point of view, because I imagine you've spent quite a bit of time in recent years in New Zealand, what your observations were of, of the, the differences. And in, and in fact, you sort of say this with the kicker line, what Australia can learn from New Zealand, which assumes... Or well, I'm assuming that you've assumed that there are things that we can learn. Look, um, I, I, I was doing that partly to be provocative um, because, uh, because of course, most Australians think we've got nothing to learn from New Zealand and uh, uh, Kiwis think that there's quite a lot we could probably learn. Um, I, I think that what, what the message in that kicker really is, is it's not just that we might learn good things from New Zealand. We might learn about things that we've done better 
or we might learn about things that aren't discussed in our political landscape, even though they're such similar issues. It's not necessarily that I'm saying New Zealand does everything right, we do everything wrong. It's more that it gives us an opportunity to pull out bits of our discussion which we take for granted and look at what happens in an economy which in a lot of ways is very, very similar to ours, in a culture that's very, very similar to ours and see how 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 it works and also how people deal with it. You know, the, the idea that politics can be different and that, it, it, you know, it, it makes you sort of think about, well, who is it who actually takes part in these political discussions? I loved all your, um, the historical uh, references, particularly how the whole Anzac spirit kind of came about and what that actually means and unpacking that. And not for the first time, when I was reading your essay, the, the Australia, Australia's official war uh, historian Charles Bean pops up yet again, yet again stirring the pot. How many books have I read where he's there just stirring behind the scenes? But you point out that um, that in his observations and chronicling of the World War I battlefields, that Charles Bean actually had some unfavourable observations of the New Zealanders during that time. And I wonder whether that all kind of fed this is it a superiority that Australia developed? I'm not sure what it is, actually. But um, there was something, was, was that like the moment, do you think, World War I and just post-World War I? Um, I think that was, I think it was a really important point in time because it's become, you know, Anzac has become such uh, an important myth uh, to us, you know, um, but we sort of tend to forget what the NZ stands for. Um, and um, uh, I think uh, it, it does. A lot of it does stem from there. Um, and there's a there's a quote. Um, if I can just very very quickly find it, you know, the fact that and Australians basically claimed ANZAC, and the New Zealanders were pretty pissed off about this from very early on. Um, and uh, Dennis McLean, who's a former very senior uh, New Zealand foreign affairs official, says. Uh, New, Zealand, New Zealanders' exasperation with such Australian self-absorption and conceits would become a large element of their own sense of identity, that, um, and it, it has remained so. Many were bitter. He says, uh, and, and it's, he says um, that both of them, both countries, sort of ended up with this sort of maimed sense of uh, nationhood, um, and uh, as a result of that, you know, that they were sort of both so desperately determined to have different legends, if you like, that, uh, that they didn't really need to have, you know, that, that this was a, this really was a shared story. And of course, the, the rhetoric that we get, you know, from our politicians, it was always about, you know, ties forged in blood, blah, blah, blah. But it's actually, it's actually more, more complicated on that, you know, at, in that way um, in the day. Laura, it's funny, isn't it, that there's, uh, there's Scott Morrison who comes from a marketing background and yet Jacinda Ardern is such a brilliant communicator of the message. I think we would, regardless of your politics, we'd all probably agree with that. And I wondered what your thoughts are, and I know that the global pandemic in 2020 has changed uh, the rules of politics in so many ways, but what would be your observations of the responses of Morrison and Ardern? Ella, how, have, how have they actually performed um, I think uh, Jacinda Ardern has been more consistent uh, in the sense that she has consistently operated from the basis of the science, if you like. She has avoided, uh, as far as I can see, t taking too many cheap political shots. And in fact, she faced three opposition leaders during the course of this year. And the first of those to fall um, essentially was toppled because he in a series of events which started because he'd been mildly critical of some of the things that Ardern had done about the COVID crisis. Um, I think by comparison, uh, Scott Morrison redeemed himself from the absolute debacle of the bushfires and the Holly, uh, Hollywood, <laughs> the uh, Hawaii trip uh, by, you know, his early responses, um, well, not those very early responses about going to the footy, but by the um, stimulus packages. Uh, I think he re redeemed himself. But it's been much more patchy. You know, he, he, he's not been able to resist um, the uh, cheap shots at uh, state premiers. Uh, you know, it's always a fine line between cheap shots and 
trying to pressure a state premier to do something that they're not doing that you don't like. Uh, and I think that has t taken away from his authority in all of these things, you know, and the fact that, you know, there's this sense that in a lot of these um, program, programs that have been introduced, you know, they haven't really been thought through or they've, they, they, they just can't help themselves, you know, whether it's keeping universities out of JobKeeper or announcing an arts package at the Rudy Hill RSL Club, though I know it's not called the RSL Club anymore, but, you know, um, and saying it was for the tradies who work backstage and turns out that nobody gets any money until, you know, things actually take off again. And, you know, it was all just that meanness around the edge that I think, uh, you know, it was that sort of sense of trickiness, I think, you know, really took away from, you know, what could have otherwise been a real triumph for him. We have a question from Richard Tuppen, who is has joined us today, Laura, and he says, I'm wondering what's frustrating you most about the way politicians are responding to questions from journalists these days. Is there any way you think the press gallery can overcome this? And he also thanks you for your time today too. But um, Thank you, Richard. Uh, look, uh, that basically they don't answer our questions at all. Um, I was having dinner with... Um, a, a staffer from the Keating era the other day who was back in Canberra for the first time and I was explaining how now, you know, you go to a press conference and they don't actually release the press release telling you what the press conference is about until after the press conference. So you are completely reliant on the information that the Minister of, of the day gives you. Um, I think uh, there's... It, it, and, and, you know, you look at the National Accounts press conference that uh, the Treasurer did the other day. Now, he's not the first person to do this, but they now give this really long and, you know, dull as dishwater slide presentation. And, oh, look, is that the time? I've only got a question for five minutes. So they pull every stunt in the book. Uh, and it is very frustrating to get answers to questions. Um, I've been sort of urging... Um, you know, that we, 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 I think as journos, we've got to sort of basically play it a bit smarter. I mean, the pollies have now got so many outlets uh, to go to, uh, you know, whether it's, um, you know, Sky After Dark, ABC 24, um, radio, whatever, where they can have a smaller audience, but they can say, well, look, we've been out there answering questions. Um, and I think we've forgotten the fact that you know, we still do hold this card, which is that uh, if if you don't talk to us, the other side will. And I think people have become a bit too cowed into this view that you don't want to look like you're, you know, pushing the Labor card. You know, they've, they've really, I think, infiltrated the entire media with that idea or, you know, that you don't want to be pushing an argument that the Greens are pushing. But it's not about pushing an argument. If If the other side is raising questions and the government isn't answering it, you should give them a run. Um, you know, if... If, if the um, Defence Minister won't turn up on 7.30 for an interview, you say, well, uh, we asked the Defence Minister to come on to talk to us about, you know, the Burriton Inquiry or whatever, and she said no, so we're going to talk to the opposition guy because there's one thing that um, that politicians hate is when you actually talk to the other side. <laughs> so, so it is frustrating. Um, I, I think that the current crop of politicians actually don't know, don't actually realise uh, or conceptualise the idea of accountability. I really don't think they know that. They've sort of learnt the games in a sort of series of sort of shadow um, discussions, you know, they've sort of learnt half-life uh, experiences and they don't even know why they're doing it, but it's, it's pretty shit. For the last at least 10 years, we've instead had this sort of polarised media you know, the culture wars, um, the sort of the, the, the Murdoch attack around the world, not just here on public broadcasters, uh, you know, quite, quite openly and explicitly saying that they shouldn't, they shouldn't be public broadcasters and having several, you know, sen senior journalists basically paid full time to just find ways of uh, getting into the ABC, um, you know, this sort of divide that, crosses across from politics into the media of, you know, branding everybody as left and right. Um, I think that has, I think the media has allowed itself to be too distracted by that. Um, you know, we, we should all just ignore the Australian, frankly, and, uh, <laughs> and just get on with doing the job that we think that we need to do. Uh, and, you know, the fact that you've got the Guardian coming up and breaking a lot of stories now, um, 
and, you know, okay, it's of a left of centre perspective. That's fine, you know, that's fine. But the, the, the issue is, you know, as, as, as you would know, the great old saying, um, the, the news is the stuff they don't want you to print, all the rest is advertising. And I think partly just the, um, the sort of absolutely sort of perpetual starving demand for, in, for, uh, for content for, for the 24-7 channels and for websites and constant updates is actually what's sort of killing really good journalism because, you know, you're just constantly feeding this machine without actually having a chance to look back, give people context and get them to understand what's going on. And I think, you know, at, at this stage of my career, that's what I'm really focused on. I, I, I What I'm trying to do is 7.30, which they're really backing, is to say, it, well, my, 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 my thesis is that one of the reasons people are so sort of disconnected from the news is that, you know, you, they hear some story about something and they don't actually know why it's important or what the context is. So my sort of approach is always to say, well, this is why this is important. This is what the history of it is. So that people go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I know about that. Um, I can understand what that discussion is about. And I don't think we actually do enough of that anymore. While I was reading your commentary regarding Jacinda Ardern, it did make me wonder when will Australia evolve to the point where women vying for leadership positions is the norm and not the novelty? And what is your view of what has happened this year, that particularly that Four Corners report, that most excellent report, which made us reflect not just on men behaving badly, but what was it that allowed them to behave badly? What was it about the bubble of Canberra and then also the government in the next two weeks kind of handballing it or, or putting it to one side in a way that I felt was quite dismissive, particularly for women. Mm. Look, there's, there's been obviously a lot of raging debate about that Four Corners program. Um, and uh, I think as a result, a lot of the sort of underlying points that were in it were lost. Uh, because there was all this focus, um, you know, the government attacked very, very sort of hard and early about sort of making all these suggestions about, you know, what, what it was all about and why didn't they include uh, allegations about labour people in it. Well, the reason was, as, as was explained, was that they ran the bits that they could run because you could have somebody on television talking about it. Um, and uh, I don't think for a moment that it's something that is limited to the Labor, to the Liberal Party at all. Uh, I think the underlying messages of that are that women now are in Parliament in record numbers, but as I think Kate Ellis tweeted, and I mentioned it in a couple of things I wrote, you know, she said, you know, sexual misconduct is still used as a weapon against women in politics. And you've got the case of Emma Hussar, uh, with those really scandalous uh, uh, sort of uh, rumours um, in a broadcast um, as fact by an another female journalist, and it was a disgrace. Um, you've got all you've got that sort of sexualisation of the way women are treated in politics still, and it's you know I mean obviously Julia Gillard and the commentary about her body and what she was wearing and all that stuff, but it's more in that sort of that really nasty level of the fact that uh, women um, have sort of have sort of suggestions of uh, sexual misbehaviour used against them, uh, and and also for staffers that and and this was I think the the real point of that piece that for the for the staffer involved basically her political career came to an end she was moved to another office and then frozen out. Um, whereas the minister suffered no ill consequences and the prime minister just does this thing of saying, oh, well, you know, that all happened before the official bonk ban came in, though we're not a, to call it the bonk ban because that's so offensive, you know, not what they might have actually been doing. Um, so therefore it's all okay. Uh, so there is this really, you know, pathetic double standard here. And as people who've been in the corporate sector would tell you, and as we've seen with, you know, people who've resigned in high-profile circumstances in the corporate sector in the last six months, it's no longer acceptable there and it shouldn't be acceptable in Canberra. <laughs>